So a few years ago, in 2012, in his commencement speech at Harvard University, Fareed Zakaria told Harvard's graduating class that we live in an age of peace. Let me read you a short excerpt from his optimistic address. He said, the world we live in is, first of all, at peace, profoundly at peace. The richest countries of the world are not in geopolitical competition with one another, fighting wars, proxy wars, or even engaging in arms races or cold wars. This is a historical rarity. You'd have to go back hundreds of years to find a similar period of great power peace. I know that you watch a bomb going off in Afghanistan or hear of a terror plot in our country and think we live in dangerous times. But here is the data. The number of people who have died as a result of war, civil war, and yes, terrorism, is down 50% this decade from the 1990s, and it's down 75% from the preceding five decades, the decades of the Cold War, and it is, of course, down 99% from the decade before that, which was World War II. Steven Pinker says that we're living in the most peaceful time in human history, and he must be right because he's a Harvard professor. <laughs> so how does this quote strike you? When Zakaria says that the world we live in is profoundly at peace, does that seem right to you? Do you say, yes, I feel the same way too? Or, or do you say, I'm not sure we're living on the same planet? So I, I'm not sure we're living on the same planet is, the, is the, kind of the most common reaction. And, and is that because things have gotten so much worse since spring of 2012, or is it because we kind of question what, what his assertions were back then? So before I go on and go deeper into this question, I want to introduce you to the literature that I'm going to be referencing this morning. Um, when Fareed Zakaria mentioned Harvard professor Steven Pinker, he was making reference to one of Pinker's recent books. I brought a little show and tell for us today. A 700-page behemoth entitled The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence Has Declined. And Zakaria was actually understating Pinker's thesis. Pinker not only writes about there being less war, he says that we live in a world with less violence of all kinds. So I'm going to put that over here. I'm shameless with my show and tell. Just, this will continue. And so to be honest with you, I, I didn't really do anything more than skim that doorstop of a book. <laughs> But I did pick up a much more um, easier book, thinner, The End of War by John Horgan. At a much more civilized 200 pages, Horgan offers a meditation on human nature and about the assumptions and excuses that people make in claiming that war is natural or inevitable. So we're going to put that aside as well. And then lest you think I am some kind of slacker reading the really short one and not the long one, I also have to show you <laughs> this is um, Rising Up and Rising Down, William T. Volman's 3,300-page, seven-volume work of obsession, a treatise on violence. Um, and I actually read the entire thing. So, um, And it's his attempt to offer, and it's getting Getting, put this down. Yeah. This is a, uh, there we go. I feel like getting heavy in my arms there. Um, so what he does in, in this book is he tries to offer a moral calculus on when is violence justified. He tries to answer the question, when is violence justified? When is it justified in defense of country, of land, of race, of gender, of creed? When is violence justified in defense of the earth and animals, in defense of revolution, among many other considerations? Um, and really, I'm not going to talk about that book very much. I just think it's really interesting, and I wanted to show off. So, <laughs> so that's the literature. That's the literature that informs some of my remarks this morning. But let me return to that provocative quote with which I began the sermon. <laughs> 
how many of you would describe the world as profoundly at peace? Are we living in the same world? Look around our nation and our world. Turn on the news, and what do you see? See a lot of things that don't exactly sound like peace. See ISIS's reign of brutality in Syria and Iraq. Russia occupying the Ukraine. Boko Haram committing crimes against humanity in Nigeria. You see North Korea and Israel-Palestine and Pakistan and Yemen. Or consider the domestic scene, battling biker gangs in Texas, police shootings of unarmed African-American teenagers, grisly murders, sexual assaults on college campuses. Each day, the news brings us a new reminder of the violence in our world. But this morning, I want to bring you some good news about peace, and I'm going to start with John Horgan. John Horgan, um, the author of a short book, turns to science and philosophy to offer us some good news about peace. He talks about in 2003, right after the US invasion of Iraq, going to speak to an Episcopalian church about whether there was a genetic basis for violence. John Horgan um, was the senior writer for Scientific American for more than a decade, and he's a specialist in science journalism, in helping the public to better understand scientific ideas. He writes, when I asked the 60 or so audience members if they thought humanity would ever abolish war, only a dozen hesitantly raised their hands. This was no anomaly. Ever since that evening, I've obsessively asked people whether they think war will ever end, once and for all. I've carried out polls whenever I've had a captive audience, and over 80% of those I've queried, liberal, conservative, male, female, affluent, poor, educated, uneducated, they all say that war will never end. But then he asks a follow-up question. He asks the question, why? Why will war never be abolished? And here's where it gets interesting. As it turns out, none of the answers to that question of why there has to be war are necessary or inevitable or have any sort of scientific validity. Horgan argues that there is no basis for saying that war must exist. In fact, in the 1980s, a group of 20 of the world's leading scientists in fields like genetics and neuroscience met under the auspices of the United Nations and issued a statement that war lacks a biological or a genetic basis. Their statement begins with five declarations. It's scientifically incorrect to say that we have inherited a tendency to make war from our animal ancestors. It's scientifically incorrect to say that war or any other violent behavior is genetically programmed into human nature. It's scientifically incorrect to say that in the course of human evolution, there's been a selection for aggressive behavior more than other kinds of behavior. It's scientifically incorrect to say that humans have a violent brain. It's incorrect to say that war is caused by instinct or any single motivation. Lacking a compelling basis for war's necessity, history proves that not even resource scarcity necessarily leads to war. Horgan is left to conclude that the human capacity for the exercise of free will means that war is not inevitable. That, for Horgan, is the good news about peace. And if Horgan's short book, The End of War, operates mostly in the realm of reason, Pinker's long book brings the evidence Making use of chart after chart, graph after graph, Pinker shows us a world that has become less war-stricken by magnitudes over the past century. Pinker refers to the period in which we are living as the new peace. He writes, it may always be something, but there can be fewer of those things, and the things that happen don't have to be as bad. The numbers tell us that not only war, but also genocide and terrorism have declined over the past two decades, not to zero, but by a lot. Millions of people are alive today because of civil wars and genocides that did not take place, but that would have taken place if the world has remained, had remained as it was in the 60s or 70s or 80s. I'm not sure I can do justice to this with just a quote or just by describing his analysis, 
but in graph after graph, research after research, evidence after evidence, he depicts fatalities from war, from genocide, and from terrorism. And in every single graph, it shows that the closer we get to the present, the less, sort of, the less of this sort of violence there is. And this is true even if we include terrorism. Between 1980 and 2001, the four years with the least amount of terrorism were 1998, 1999, 2000, and 2001. 2001 had less terrorism than any of the 16 years from 1980 to 1997. Isn't that interesting? But that's not all the good news. Pinker also describes the historical era in which we are living as the era of the rights revolution. We're living in an era of civil rights, an era in which our society has decided to address lynching and hate crimes. We're living in the era of women's rights, an era in which our society has decided to address rape and domestic violence. We're living in the era of children's rights, in which our society has decided to address infanticide, child abuse, and bullying. We're living in the era of gay rights, with a decline of gay bashing and an increasingly worldwide acceptance of homosexuality, of same-sex marriage, as we saw in Ireland. And Pinker says we're even living in the era of animal rights, in which we as a society have decided to address cruelty to animals in many forms. These, Pinker says, are all extremely modern phenomena. The notion that one partner should not be allowed to beat the other, that a parent should not be allowed to beat a child, that rape is not boys being boys, that bullying is not a normal aspect of childhood, and that violence directed against vulnerable, mi vulnerable minorities is wrong. These awakenings, he says, are actually sadly recent in the course of human history. And so if I can introduce a moment of levity here to make this point, I might mention one example of how this greater sensitivity against violence has permeated our culture. Some years ago, it was after I graduated from elementary school, the National Association for Sport and Physical Education introduced a brand new standard that declared dodgeball is not an appropriate activity for K-12 school physical education programs. The, the standard declared, some kids may like it, the most skilled, the most confident, but many do not. Certainly not the student who gets hit hard in the stomach, head, or groin. It is not appropriate to teach our children that you win by hurting others. This may seem like a silly example to some of us, or not so silly if you were one of those students back in the day who was targeted in gym class. But this example is just a small, small data point in this larger argument that Steven Pinker makes, that the pronounced decline in violence the world over, the world has seen for centuries and decades, has actually been the result of our greater awareness of suffering, diminished tolerance for violence, and greater reverence for human life. Our new consciousness challenges the idea of making compulsory an activity in which children are made the targets of projectiles hur hurled by their peers. We are more sensitive, but that's not a bad thing. Pinker writes, the moral commonplaces of our age, such as that slavery, war, and torture are wrong, would have been seen as saccharine sentimentality, sentimentality in ages past, and our notion of universal human rights would have been thought almost incoherent. The good news about peace, Pinker says, is that war is less, genocide is less, terrorism is less, and violence on the whole is less. The bad news is that it has not been completely eradicated. And finally, he says, the news that is both good and bad is that the decline of violence has not left us joyful or contented, but rather increasingly restless, less tolerant and less accepting of the violence that continues to exist within our midst. What he's saying here is that, is that actually 
as violence decreases, we grow more sensitive to violence, more determined to eradicate what violence is left. In William Stafford's famous poem at the Unnational Monument along the Canadian border, Stafford imagines, in contrast to all those monuments that are built to commemorate battles and wars, what it would, like, what it would be like to build a monument to the absence of war. This is the field where the battle did not happen, where the unknown soldier did not die. He goes on to say that this unmonument is hallowed by neglect and that people celebrate it by forgetting it's there. Pinker would say that our greater sensitivity to violence, our greater concern about violence, our greater repulsion away from violence is tied to this decrease in actual violence. A couple weeks ago, I attended the NAACP's Moral Monday event in Raleigh. Speaking, William Barber articulated some strong ideas about the moral vision of this movement. Speaking in response to the events that were unfolding right at that time, the, the riots in Baltimore, Barber said that we must be more concerned about the violence that is at the heart of the political and economic order. He named forms of violence. He said that economic exploitation is a form of violence, that lack of health care is a form of violence, that disinvesting in education is a form of violence, that environmental deregulation is a form of violence. I think William Barber is absolutely correct here, and I think these words channel this greater awareness, this greater awareness of the violence that is and the determination to do away with it. As he spoke, realized that William Barber was channeling Archbishop Oscar Romero, who said, I will not tire of declaring that if we really want an effective end to violence, we must remove the violence that lies at the root of all violence, structural violence, social injustice, inclusion, exclusion of citizens from the management of the country, repression. All this is what constitutes the primal cause from which the rest flows naturally. And so my words to you this morning are words of paradox. Objectively, according to Steven Pinker, objectively, violence in the world is decreasing. Subjectively, violence is all around us, and it urgently, urgently needs our attention. Paradoxically, the more we perceive the violence in the world and the more we refuse to tolerate it, the more we insist that it be eradicated, the more our world moves towards an even greater peace. I invite you to embrace this paradox, this restlessness as a spiritual gift, a characteristic of the evolution of human society and of the human spirit. Amen.